Go ahead and open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, and we welcome those that are joining us on Facebook Live and Zoom. I'm Pastor Mike at Avro Community Church. I'm glad that you have joined us this beautiful Christmas Eve service. Just a reminder that we will be having our candlelight service this evening at 6 p.m. And also all of our services are recorded and available through Right Now Media and YouTube. We have reached week four of our Advent sermon series. I have entitled today's message uh, simply The Preparation. The Preparation. For the last three weeks, we've been preparing ourselves to receive the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, born in a manger in the town of Bethlehem. But I want to make sure that we are physically focused on what this event means. Isaiah chapter 40 has been our jumping off point for the last couple of weeks, and I hope you have found your way there. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 is where we're going to start our time together this morning. And we read these words, a voice of one crying out, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness, make a straight highway for our God in the deserts. This is the, the message that the prophet Isaiah proclaimed to let us know that the Messiah was coming. Now, let me give you a little bit of context here. Israel is in the midst of deep darkness. They have just been told in Isaiah chapter 39 that exile is coming as a form of punishment. They understand that judgment was coming because of what they have chosen, what they have done, and that is turn their backs on God. They have decided to do their own thing. They have decided to live life the way they want to live. In the book of Judges, we see this phrase over and over again. They did what was right in their own eyes. And then Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah proclaims that this exile, this judgment would be temporary. And we get to verse 3 and we see this proclamation, a reminder, if you will, that the Messiah will come. How do you make such a proclamation? How do you make the proclamation that a person of honor is coming? What is it like to prepare for such a special event? What do you do to bear, pardon the word, hype it up? where people grab their attention is grabbed and they want to know more and want to be a part of it. Now, for most of us in this room, we don't know what it's like to make a proclamation that is earth shattering and life altering as Isaiah did here in chapter 40. I want to give an example though. Something very earthly pales in comparison to what Isaiah is proclaiming here. And that is, if you've ever been to a sporting event, you know what it's like. The game is about to begin. The hype music begins to be played over the PA announced, uh, PA speakers. They, the, the team lines the tunnel under the stadium, getting ready to come out. The smoke machines start to uh, blow smoke, and that announcer announces each player one by one, and the crowd gets wild. The music gets louder. The stadium shakes, and the game begins. But the game is temporary. It doesn't matter who wins or loses those games. And just a short time down the road, nobody will even remember who won those games. Even if it was a record-shattering game, people will struggle to remember the details. My friends, the announcement that Isaiah makes in chapter 40 
is of such magnitude that 2,000 years later, we are still talking about it. The event that Isaiah proclaims in chapter 40, verse 3, is of such life-changing event that 2,000 years later, we are still celebrating it. And let us not be naive. We are no different than the people of Israel of Isaiah's time. We're living in a very dark time. We're living in a time where the scripture, the truth of the scripture is being debated. Not from the fact, is it authentic? Is it genuine? But from the fact is, did God really mean that we should live that way? Did, did God really mean that these are sins and this is righteousness? Did God really mean that we should live in such a way that brings him honor and glory? Did God really mean that I could not live the way I want to live anymore? And then church, just look around. And we see people compromising on the truth of God. And it is in those dark times that the light of the child, the Messiah, the Christ, was born. Put yourself in the position of the Jews at this time. They just got this notice of discipline. But they've been living in this time where they've been told generation after generation after generation that God was going to do something great, that God was going to do something magnificent, that God was going to do something miraculous, and it didn't happen. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited. And Isaiah gives them this word of hope. Don't stop waiting. It is coming. Don't give up. Don't look away. Don't give, give in to the pressures of this world, but continue to prepare because the light is coming. The darkness will fade away. If you were to go to the last book of the Old Testament, you would read the words of the prophet Malachi. One simple term from the last chapter of Malachi, puts you into the first chapter of the book of Matthew. The, the division of what we call the Old Testament into the New Testament. And, and by the, the, the greatness of this book, we can shift gears by just turning the page. But let me tell you what that page turn represents. From the last words of Malachi to the first words of Matthew, 400 years of silence. Four hundred years. Where are you, God? Didn't you tell us something was going to happen? Didn't you tell us that life would be different? Didn't you tell us that you would rescue us? Where are you, God? Now, let's be honest. We've experienced that time of silence in our lives, haven't we? We, we have experienced that this depth of darkness that's been so deep that we look and we, where are you, God? Where are you, God? Flip over in your Bibles to the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. The silence is about to end. The darkness is about to part. The hope is about to be fulfilled. Mark chapter 1. Beginning in verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way. A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way 
for the Lord make his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. In the middle of this darkness, in the middle of this silence, here is this one, this voice crying out in the wilderness. John, the cousin of Jesus, we know him as John the Baptist, and we understand his lifestyle was one that was a little weird for his time, wearing camel, camel hair clothes, eating locusts and honey, and he walked around the town preaching a different message. The message of the Old Testament that had been perverted by the religious leaders has now been challenged by the message of John the Baptist. See, I want you to hear me very clearly this morning, church. The message didn't change. The, the way the message was delivered was different. The message of the Old Testament was simple. Have sacrifice in order to be in a right relationship with God. But religious leaders kept putting more and more on there. And it made it so difficult for the Israelites to understand what a right relationship with God looked like. Not only did you have to obey the law, but you had to obey the teachings of your rabbi. You had to do these rituals and fulfill these traditions. And it got burdensome and cumbersome. And the people of Israel wilted under the pressure. But then here is John the Baptist. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. The message is simple. It is not one of these external anticipations or the external rituals or traditions, but it is one that focuses on the heart. John the Baptist didn't focus on the things that you do to have a right relationship with God. His message was one that focused on your heart condition. Where does your heart line up? What is your heart doing? Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. For generations, they've been waiting for the fulfillment of that proclamation, the kingdom of God coming to people, coming to us. And here John the Baptist is preparing the way, crying out in the wilderness, making the road straight, proclaiming this baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. That's where Israel was, isn't it? They, they have forsaken their relationship with God. They have, they have forsaken their position as the chosen people of God to do their own thing. And it is in the midst that uh, John the Baptist comes in and says, repent. Oh, praise God, that message is for you and I today. Praise God that that message is still being proclaimed with boldness today. Let me share with you my experience. I was fortunate enough to grow up in the church. I was fortunate enough to go to Christian school from kindergarten all the way through graduation of my master's degree. I was fortunate enough to be around people that encouraged a, a relationship with Jesus and challenged your relationship with Jesus and strengthened your relationship with Jesus. But yet, even in those situations, I was walking in darkness. Because what the mind knew, the heart had not received. Sitting in a gymnasium at school in March 1984, I, I'm sitting in the front row, not by choice, but because I had gotten in trouble and was forced to sit in the front row. But God is good all the time. And Greg Smiley is re uh, teaching in our, in our, our, our chapel setting. And it felt like all of a sudden, uh, all the hundred of other students were gone. And it was just he and I in that, in that room. And something he said transformed this information that I had in my mind and moved it to my heart. And I understood for the first time in my 14 years that I needed 
to re re repent and receive the kingdom of God. And Greg, he pr prayed, and I tell you, without exaggeration, by the time he lifted his head and said, amen, I'm nose to nose with him wanting to know what I needed to know to repent of my sins. I walked out of the darkness. My prayer this Christmas Eve is that the light of the Christ child pierces your darkness. That if you have not yet received the message of salvation that is born in Bethlehem on this dark and weary night 2,000 years ago, that I pray that today is the day that you receive the greatest gift ever given. Throughout the history of Scripture, every time Israel turned away from God, God provided a way for them to come back. Every time. And this encouragement was through the remnant, the, the, the small group that remained faithful to God, and they encouraged repentance. And we see that encouragement for repentance embodied in the person of John the Baptist. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. And I tell you here this morning, December 24, 2023, that the kingdom of God is near. I want to shift my focus for just a moment this morning. If we go back to the Old Testament, we see the work of the remnant. We see the work of Daniel and Nehemiah and Ezra as they encourage the people of Israel to repent of their sins. We see in the New Testament people like John the Baptist and the disciples as they would go and they proclaim this new updated uh, message to tell people to change your hearts. But we need to understand this morning that that little child born in Bethlehem doesn't stay a little child, does he? He grows up and he ministers to his people he touches them where they are. He brings healing of their brokenness. He heals their bodies, their, their, their minds. He shows his power over nature as he calms the storms and he raises the dead to life. And all of that leads to his death on a cross. See, if we don't go from the manger to the cross, then the life of Christ means nothing. If we don't go from the manger in Bethlehem to the cross of Golgotha, then the life of Christ doesn't change a thing. We need to move to the cross to fully understand what the gift of God is all about. As Patty sang just a minute ago, what kings give up their thrones for you? What king gives up their son for you? The God, the creator of the universe, the living, one true living God gave up his one and only begotten son so that we may experience him anew. So that we would understand what forgiveness of sin was all about. That we could once again sit in the presence of God as was intended in the book of Genesis. At just the right time in human history, the birth of a child that would change the history of the world took place. At just the right time in human history, God intervened and said, enough is enough. At just the right time in history, the Son of God left the comforts of heaven and put on flesh and was born as a helpless baby to save the world. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 3, just a couple of verses later, he, a couple of chapters later in the Gospels. He says this, he says, I have come not to condemn the world, but I have come to save the world. 
the message of John the Baptist was the same message that Jesus proclaimed. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. What we see in the difference between the sacrificial system of the Old Testament and the, the message of the New Testament is clear. It's not about what you do. It's not about duty. It's not about obligation. It's about relationship. It's not about fulfilling a checklist and, and pulling out your list to make sure everything is done on a daily basis. Uh, you know, went to church. I read my Bible. I prayed. Yeah, I did all that. I, I'm a good Christian today. That's not what it's about. What it's about is did you let this baby of Bethlehem enter your life and change you from the inside out. The gift of the Old Testament was understanding that I am unrighteous, I am unholy, and I cannot have relationship with God unless I am righteous. And the sacrificial system allowed me to do that. The message of the New Testament is this, you keep failing, let me be the ultimate sacrifice for you so that you never have to sacrifice again. How much does God love you? So much so that he sent his son to die for you. So much so that the ultimate sacrifice of the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God, upon that cross, upon that tree in Golgotha, in that empty tomb three days later, is the ultimate sacrifice that washes away not just your sin, but the stain of the sin in your life. That is the message that is seen through the, the proclamation of John the Baptist. So where do we get to the preparation part? The preparation part is this. Open your heart to receive. Open your heart to receive the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Some of you in, in the room this morning, by the sound of my voice, may be having family or friends come over to celebrate Christmas. And, and I know what you've been doing because it's been going on in my house. I know what you've been doing. You've been cleaning. You've been buying food. You've been cooking. You've been doing everything possible. So when that special guest arrives, they will feel welcomed and they will feel comfortable. And the house smells good. The house looks good. And the food is tasty and on point and everything goes right. We need to do the same thing for our hearts because it is the home of the King of Kings. We need to, to by the power of the Holy Spirit, clean our hearts. We need to, to remove those things that are hindering our relationship with him. We need to remove those things that are preventing us from fully understanding who he is and what he wants to do in our lives. We need, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to, to spread away the darkness and clean the uh, what we need to do is get off the throne and allow him to sit down. That's where the preparation is. So this Christmas Eve day, for some, it's going to be busy. Some of you are already thinking about what are you going to do when you get home to cook. I, I know. I can read your mind. I see the thought bubbles above your heads. Some of you, I, I got to go to the store yet. Good luck at Publix. <laughs> Some of you are, are thinking, I got to go home and vacuum. I got to go home and finish laundry. I got to go home and do this. I got to go home and do this. And I'm going to give you a word from your pastor. I want you to take a breath. I want you to slow down. And I want you to remember that it's not about the Christmas tree. It's not about the ornaments. It's not about the gifts underneath it. It's not about whether or not your house is spick and span and clean from top to bottom. It's all about have you made room in your heart for this child, Christ child, the Messiah. That's what it's about. Repent. For the kingdom of God is near. The challenge this Christmas season is to prepare your heart for his arrival. If you have not received him, praise be God, it's not too late. If you have not received him, let today be the day of a new beginning.
Let today be the beginning of a new life. For the scripture tells us all of you have received him. The old have passed away and all things have become new. If you have received him and you are rejoicing in the celebration for another year, rejoice in the fact that his return will be soon coming. We can all celebrate in the gift of redemption. Here's my conclusion for all of us this morning. John proclaimed the message of preparation. That message is now ours to proclaim. Stand to your feet this morning. I'm going to ask Miss Ann to come and play for just a moment. If this message is for you this morning, now is the time to do something about it. If you've heard this message proclaimed boldly that it is time to repent and receive the kingdom of God for it is near, and then let this day be the day that you make that proclamation in your life and say, I'm ready to repent. I'm ready to be redeemed and restored by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's simple. It is as simple as taking that gift from under the tree and ripping off the package, uh, the paper to reveal what's inside the package. It is as simple as this. Admit that you are a sinner. The Bible tells us, for we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible goes on to tell us that the wages of sin is death. But thankfully, that verse does not end there. It goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life. And how do we get that gift? By, by faith, receiving the, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Allow his blood to cleanse you from the inside out. The Bible tells us, that if we confess with our mouth and belief in our hearts that Jesus is the Son of God, you shall be saved. There are no other strings attached. But the good thing is, when you enter into that relationship, he begins to do the work inside of you. So if that is you this morning and you want to receive Jesus for the first time, I encourage you to come. 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 If you are here this morning, you've received this gift, but you have not been walking in the grace of Christ. You have not been walking in the love of Christ. And quite frankly, you may be here this morning and you have lost the joy of that relationship of walking with Christ. Let today be the day of renewal. Let today be the day of starting over. Thankfully, we serve a God that allows you turns. And maybe you are here and you've gotten off the path. That's okay. He'll pick you up. He'll brush off the dirt and he'll put you back on the path of righteousness. First John tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. So if that is you this morning and you've gotten a little haywire in your walk, come back, come home. He's here waiting for you with open arms. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the, the encouragement, the proclamation, that repent for the kingdom of God is near. I pray, Lord, if there is one here this morning that needs to, to make an action, needs to, to respond to what they've heard this morning, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, they would be able to do so. Have your way. Have your way this morning, we pray. Amen. I'll be down front for just a moment as the end plays. Come. You all see the